Hello. Hello. Forgive me, I'm hoarse today. It's the weather. Uh, I want you to have maximum time with Vernon, so I'll be brief. Hillary met Vernon Jordan in 1960. Uh, we later became friends in ways that are too numerous and too personal sometimes to recount. We have formed a bond that is indescribable. He is legitimately considered one of the last original heroes of the Civil Rights Movement. He did great work at the Urban League. I think the first time I introduced him was in the 1970s when he came to Little Rock to speak to the Urban League and I was a young attorney general. In 1980, when I lost my bid for re-election as governor in the Reagan landslide, Vernon Jordan called Hillary on the phone and said, you got any grits down there? <laughs> and have you learned how to make them? <laughs> being a Yankee girl and all. And she said yes, and he said, well, I'm coming to breakfast. He flew all the way to Little Rock just to have breakfast with us when I was the youngest former governor in the history of the country <laughs> <laughs> with them prospects. When I got elected president, he was the only friend I had who literally refused to take any position in government. He said, you need a friend, somebody who's always there for you. And if I take a job, I'll have to do that. And I can be your friend, but you're better off if I just stay your friend. Keep in mind, we'd been out of power for 12 years, and I had 10 disappointees for every person I could appoint to anything. <laughs> except Vernon. He spends a lot of his life helping young people now. And uh, after all these years, I can honestly say I never met anybody quite like him. So I will close with this. In 19, no, I want to tell it this way. <laughs> Vernon called me because he couldn't get back to Washington in time for Congressman John Dingell's funeral. Some of you may have seen some of the coverage on television. John Dingell is the longest serving congressman in American history. And he succeeded his father, who's the first person who ever introduced universal health care into Congress in the 1940s. Dingell introduced his father's bill every year until the Affordable Health Care Act was signed. And uh, we worked together and we fought. But he was a, is on the level, the, the least manipulative, most on the level, straightforward person I ever worked with in Congress, whether we were on the same side or fighting like cats and dogs. So he voted for an anti-lynching law in his conservative Polish American working class district in 1957. He said the most important vote he ever cast was for the civil rights law in 1964. He had already become a hero of the civil rights movement and he was invited to Atlanta to give a speech, a big deal for a young Michigan congressman. And the woman running the event gave a young lawyer making $35 a week the chance to introduce him because she thought it might give him a boost in his life. And because he gave such a great speech, Vernon Jordan got the boost he needed. He is no longer a $35 a week lawyer. Thank God. <laughs> but he is the same guy. <laughs> Quite an 
introduction, so I'm just going to launch right in. But first, let me say what a, a great day it is for me to be here in New York. You know, I wasn't supposed to be here this week, but when I heard Vernon was going to be here, I changed my plan so I could be here to hear you. And wow, what a special treat for me to get to be the moderator of your conversation today, Vernon. So thank you. I'm thank glad you so to see much you. for meeting our staff here today and having this conversation. Um, so as you heard President Clinton say, uh, Vernon has been um, someone who has helped young people along the way. And I'm so fortunate that actually I'm one of those young people that Vernon served as a mentor, an advisor, a career counselor, a boyfriend counselor, all those things for me um, early on in my 20-somethings uh, my when I was working in the White House and had no experience navigating Washington or how to make it in the White House. So first of all, thank you for that, Vernon. So. I'm going to ask you some questions here, and I'm going to leave plenty of time for people to be able to ask you direct questions. But first of all, I want to talk about a little bit of your growing up and growing up in segregated uh, Atlanta in the 40s and 50s as the country was really embarking on really great social change. Can you talk a little bit about some of the people that were important to you in your life growing up, role models, family members? Can you share a little bit about your early years? Yeah. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, in the segregated Grady Hospital in 1935. And um, we moved in 1937 into the first public housing project built for black people in America, University Homes. Uh, right across the street from Spelman College, Clark College, all in the Atlanta University Center. Uh, my father worked at a warehouse and my mother had a catering service. And um, I, growing up, my introduction to politics was in 1943. I'm sitting with my father after supper listening to WSB radio. And they said, we have a political announcement. And the governor of Georgia, then Eugene Talmadge, came on the radio and said, this is your governor, Eugene Talmadge. I am running for re-election. I have two planks in my platform, <laughs> and roads. I'm against the first and for the second. That was my introduction to politics at eight years old in 1943. About the same time, an itinerant Baptist preacher in Muskogee County, that's Columbus, Georgia, went to the courthouse, went to the voter registration office and said, I want to register to vote in the white primary and he was told that he could not register to vote in the white primary because he was colored. And he said, I own property. I am a good citizen. I pay my taxes. And I have not committed the crime of moral turpitude. I think I have the right to vote. And he was told by the registrar that he could not vote because he was colored. He leaves the courthouse, gets in his car, drives to Atlanta to see Austin Thomas Walden, the first black admitted to the bar in Georgia. Walden calls Thurgood Marshall, and they file a lawsuit called King versus Chat. And King versus Chapman, along with Smith versus Allwright, in about 1944, 45, I'm not sure which, the Supreme Court ruled that blacks had a right to vote 
in the primary. So I grew up with Talmadge on the one hand, but this itinerant Baptist preacher who, when he preached from 1 John, he never called it 1 John, he called it the I John. And I got to know Promise King, and I spent time with him. And Columbus, Georgia is not far from Tuskegee, and it's not far from Atlanta. But none of the academics at Tuskegee or in Atlanta University system ever wrote about Primus King. But I convinced a governor of Georgia to name a road in Muscogee County for, for Primus King because Primus King is, he is a hero. He's, he's, he, and nobody knows about him and everybody should know about him, especially if you grew up in, in Georgia. And in 1977, after I gave my keynote address to the National Urban League at the convention in Boston, I told the story that I just told you and introduced Primus King and he addressed the Urban League convention in, in, in Boston. And he is, he is one of my heroes and one of the most important things in my life is that I got to know Primus King, who by himself, unaccompanied, went to the Muscogee County Courthouse to register to vote and filed a lawsuit and <laughs> won it. Well, you then went on to DePaul University for college and you were one, you were uh, only the only black student in a class of 400. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you and how did it affect your outlook on education and particularly the importance of black Americans attending college but also having access to the corporate world and having opportunities to be successful? Well, as a junior in high school, I thought that I was going to Howard. Mm -hmm. University. I applied and got accepted. All of my teachers wanted me to go to Morehouse, mm -hmm. which was across the street from the housing project where I lived. And there used to be an organization here in New York called the National Service and Scholarship Fund for Negro Students, NESPNES. And in my senior year, in October, the a principal from California, representing Nespinas, came to meet with the, the, the um, uh, the smart students, that was the name for it, anyhow. And he talked about Nespinas, and it was based on a project at Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C where they took the best students and sent them to Ivy League school. So I got very interested in it. And I applied to Yale, I applied to Dartmouth, I applied to Lafayette, I applied to DePaul. The president of the Atlanta Dartmouth Alumni Association called me up and summoned me to his office. And I put on my little suit and shined my shoes and went downtown. And he said to me that 10 boys in Atlanta had applied to Dartmouth and I was the only colored. And, but I had the best academic record. And he said, the Atlanta Dartmouth Alumni Association is gonna support your application. And we're gonna do it because we want you to go to Dartmouth and get a good education and come back to Atlanta and be a Booker T. Washington for your people. And I said, sir, that won't work. He said, well, I want it work. 
I said, I'm a W.B. Du Bois man. <laughs> 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 he, he didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, but I didn't go to Dartmouth. I went to DePaul in Indiana. And I caught hell from my teachers. They would say, more house is good enough for me, it ought to be good enough for you. Hmm. Uh, my counselor said, how can you, your mother afford to send you to that school way up in Indiana? I said, just write the recommendation, please. <laughs> uh, and then I went up there doing in June to a conference on something for kids going to college. I was the only one black there. And so at the end, I went to see the director of admissions. And he said, you went to a segregated, uh, overcrowded, double session school maybe you ought to go to Ball State rather than DePaul. And the notion that you want to be a lawyer seems to me to be quite something. You ought to think about teaching social science at Crispus Attucks High School. And so I said, I'm going to be a lawyer <coughs> and I'm coming back to DePaul to be a student. And I did. I gave the commencement in 1973 and got an honorary degree and I turned around to that same director of admissions and I winked my eye. I love it. And so my mother wrote to me on August 15th, it's my birthday, and my mother called me man. And she called me man because every male, old or young, in the South was a boy. And she wanted me to know that I was a man. So man was my nickname. So on my birthday in August, she wrote me a note. Dear man, we want you to go to college wherever you want to go to college. But if you go to Howard, you might feel more comfortable and at home. So I read it and went to see her and said, Mama, I'm going to DePaul. She said, does it have an ROTC? And I said, yeah, but I have no interest in an ROTC. She said, well, son, two things are going to happen. You're going to college, and you're going to college where there's an ROTC. So I said, Mother, I have no interest in the ROTC, number one. But number two, what do you know about the ROTC? She said, not a damn thing, son. <laughs> but all of the white women that I work for in my catering business, they are sending their boys to the ROTC. There must be something to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to DePaul <laughs> and I joined the ROTC. <laughs> <laughs> So and then I got in trouble. Oh, let me just say yeah, this. Tell, tell that part. I got summoned to the commandant's office in Asbury Hall, and, and it said, come at 1300. I did not know what 1300 meant, but I found out. So at 1 o'clock, I went to his office. <laughs> i never forget this. I go in, I say to the secretary, my name is Vernon Jordan. Colonel Campbell sent for me. She said, go right in. And I went in and I said, Colonel, I'm Vernon Jordan. You sent for me. He said, get the hell out of here and come in here correctly. So I go back out and I said, he said for me to come in directly. What is he talking about? She said, you have to go in, click your heels, salute and say, Cadet Jordan reporting, sir. And my response was, no <laughs> <laughs> so, I go back in, I clip my heels, 
And I said, Cadet Jordan reporting, sir. And he said, sit down. And then he took out these papers and says, I have your application and I see where you play the trumpet and the E flat tuba. I said, that's what I did in high school. But I'm now in college and I went to an old dilapidated, segregated, ill-equipped school and I'm competing with these kids from township high schools and prep schools. So I don't, I don't have time to be in the band and, and play, play the E flat tuba. And I'm also playing basketball, so I, I don't have time. He said, I don't think you understand. I said, what don't I understand? He said, you're in the Air Force now and you will report to the band practice and so for two years, I played the E-flat tuba. <laughs> but the first semester was, of course, an introduction to aviation. I didn't like the course. I didn't like the teacher. And I didn't like standing up at attention when this sergeant walked into the room. And so I flunked it. I absolutely flunked it. But you know, the Lord moves in mysterious ways. I had to take the course over my senior year oh. in order to graduate. So I did not play in the band, but I had to march in review on Dad's day, and my father had come up from Atlanta for Father's Day. Dad say whatever. And he sat in the stadium and saw me march in review. And because he had been in the Navy in World oh. War II, he sat in the stadium and wept. Oh. He was so pleased that I was in that Air Force uniform. So the Lord moves in mysterious ways yeah. sometimes. Yeah. But the Paul was, let me just tell yeah. you a little bit about the Paul. I was the only black in my class. I had got there before the other students got there because I was a freshman. I went to 106 Logan, and it was clear that I was going to have two roommates. Mm -hmm. They were two white boys, one from Valparaiso, Indiana, and another one from outside Cleveland. And they had planned to be roommates that same year, and they get to 106 London, and there I was. And so we existed in this room. They had a desk, and I had a desk, and we each had a bed and a closet. But we sort of existed. Three weeks later, I came in from the library, and I said hello to Russ and Roy, and they said, well, we've been talking about you. I said, you have? They said, yeah. And I said, so tell me about it. They said, we have made an amazing discovery. And I said, what is it? They said, you're no different than we are. And I said, is that right? He said, yeah. I said, you study, you go to sleep at your desk, you snore, you pass gas in the bed, you sing in the shower, you grunt in the stall, you get cookies from home, you get mail. So you're just like us. So we stopped existing and we started living together. And their graduation present, my freshman year, was to take them home to Atlanta. We take the bus from Greencastle to Indianapolis and then we get on the big bus to Atlanta. And our first stop is Louisville, Kentucky. You've been on the bus from Indianapolis to Louisville. When you get off, you got to go to the bathroom. And so we head to the bathroom. There's a big sign, colored this way, white that way. They had never seen signs that said that in Indiana and in Ohio. And so they said, Vernon, what do we do? I said, you go that way, and I'm going this way, and we'll meet back here. And I took them home, they stayed at my house. I took them to church, I took them to NAACP mass meetings. I 
took them to Auburn Avenue where I hung out. I took them to the Butler Street Colored YMCA. And we became great friends. So that was how I got to Greencastle. What motivated you? I mean, that you clearly had a lot of inner strength and courage and determination. Where did that come from? I mean, those must have been some challenging experiences and that we can't even imagine today. How did you, where did you summon up that um, intestinal fortitude? I, I don't think it had to be summoned. I wanted to go to DePaul. Mm -hmm. And my mother had the best, biggest catering service in Atlanta, so I could afford to pay the tuition. Mm -hmm. But after I got there and saw all these waiters, I started waiting tables my freshman year. By my sophomore year, I was a head waiter because I went and told the lady in charge, I said, I know more about serving food than you do because I've been doing it since I was 10. Mm -hmm. And so I was a head waiter at Longdon Hall for three years. Uh, and that's when I <coughs> met Richard Nixon. He came to DePaul in 1956. And Mrs. DuPont, who was in charge of the food service said she wanted me and a guy named uh, Pat from Fort Wayne or someplace. And we served the head table. And my picture was taken serving Richard Nixon and the senator from uh, Indiana. So when I succeeded Whitney Young in 1971, mm -hmm. I got a call from the White House to come meet Richard Nixon. And so I go to the Oval Office, and it's Richard Nixon, me, on one side of the fireplace, he's on the other. And uh, um, Bob Brown, a black guy from North Carolina, was in the room. Uh, John. El, 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 what's his name? John, I can't think of his last name. He's dead now. He was there. And the, right. form, uh, the former Secretary of State, he's still alive. He lives in San Francisco. Schultz. Schultz. We were all there. And the president welcomed me and said, I thanked him for coming to Whitney's burial to speak in Kentucky. And we talked, and I said to Nixon, I said, Mr. President, I brought you something, and I went in my briefcase, and I showed him this photograph of him sitting at the table and me with my white jacket on, serving him. And he looked at me and he said, Vernon, I was a waiter in college. So we talked about being waiters in college. And then he wrote uh, something there. And it was the beginning of our, of our, of our friendship. It also reminds me of something about the president and me, President Clinton. We were at Kay Graham's house on Martha's Vineyard one summer, and all of the names that you would know were at the party. And there was a lot of singing. And in the middle of the singing, the president and I sang a duet. <laughs> wow. We, and what we sang was, uh, we sang Lift Every Voice and Sing. Me and President Clinton sang. And all of our friends, including Henry Kissinger, were stunned. <laughs> and I have a photograph of me and President Clinton singing Lift Every Voice and Sing. And he has written on it, 
the only white man who knows the words. <laughs> 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 I love it. Well, I'm thrilled that it looks like everybody here has a copy of your memoir called Vernon Can Read. I have two questions. One, what did you, why did you write the book and what did you hope for people to learn from that? And why did you call it Vernon Can Read? What's the, behind the title? My sophomore year in college, Companies came in the spring to offer us summer jobs, and you went for interviews. And Continental Insurance out of Chicago came, and I went and said, got interviewed, said I'd like to be an intern this summer. Mm -hmm. And they said, fine, and they said, you know, you will come to Chicago. I said, but you have an office in Atlanta. And they said, we do. I said, I'd like to, after commencement, go home to Atlanta and work in your Atlanta office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I stayed because I was waiting tables through commencement and then I went home and the day I was to report to work I put on my little suit and my shoes and went to the building downtown and I walked into the receptionist and I said my name is Vernon Jordan I'm a DePaul student and I'm a summer intern here at Continental Insurance Company. The lady looked up at me and said, no <laughs> <laughs> And so she picked up the phone and she called the executive in charge of interns and said, there's a colored boy here who says he's a summer intern. Can you believe it? And so he comes out takes me into his office, I go into his office, and I stand up as he sits down. And I didn't sit down because I was not invited to sit down, but I, he asked me to have a seat. And his first words to me was, they did not tell us. <laughs> and I said, they did not tell you what? He said, they did not tell us that you were colored. We had not graduated to being black then. Said so they didn't tell us that you were colored. And so I said, well, what are you going to do about it? He says, I do not know. But if you will come back tomorrow, I will have an answer. So I go back the next day and he said, I have arranged for you to have an office on Auburn Avenue, which is 125th Street of Atlanta and you will work out of there and I will come pick you up and we will go sell income protection insurance to black businesses employing five or more people. I said, but some of the interns get together and they have lunch and they do things. He said, yeah, but, but your color said you, you won't be doing that. Huh. So I did it for two weeks and then I quit after selling the income protection insurance to the Land Life Insurance Company branch in Atlanta. It's a black insurance company. And my mother got me a job as the chauffeur for Robert Maddox. Let me tell you about Mr. Maddox. He was the president of the First National Bank of Atlanta he was the president of the American Bankers Association. He sat on the platform in 1895 when Booker T. Washington gave the Atlanta Exposition Address. We can be separate as the fingers on and yet one in mutual progress. And I was his chauffeur for eight weeks that summer. And I would take him downtown in his big Cadillac and then take him to the Cap City Club where he had lunch, which lasted 30 minutes, and then I would take him home. But I had, I was also the butler, so I had to stay 
and serve him dinner while he went upstairs and took a nap. So what I did in the afternoon, I would go into his library and read over the loud protestations of Lizzie the cook. Boy, you've got no business in that white man's library. I said, Lizzie, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't tell him that I am reading in his library, I will not tell him about your deal with the grocery man. <laughs> if the grocery bill was 250, he paid, he got paid 350 or 400. Oh. But every Friday when I took Liz home, she had two turkeys, two hens. That was the dinner at Mount Zion Baptist Church where she played the piano. <laughs> so she wouldn't, she left me alone. So one day I'm sitting in his library in his chair reading because I'm a young intellect, right? from DePaul University. <laughs> and he walks in in his underwear with a bottle of Jack Daniels in one hand and a glass in the other, and he walks in and he said, Vernon, what are you doing in my library? I said, I'm reading, Mr. Maddox. I never had a <laughs> work for me who can read. I said, I can read, I'm colleged. He said, you go to those colored schools over there, meaning Morehouse, Clark, I said, no, sir, I go to DePaul University. He said, white children go to that school? Yes, sir. White girls go to that school? Yes, sir. And then he gave himself away. He said, are you going to be a teacher or a preacher? Because in his mind, if you were colored and educated, those were the only options you had. And I said, no, Mr. Maddox, I'm going to be a lawyer. He said, aren't supposed to be lawyers. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. He said, but don't you know I have a place downstairs for the help to relax? I said, yes, I do know about that. But you have these wonderful books, and I know you don't want them down there in that old dusty place. He said, but just read then, just, just read. And he goes back upstairs. And then that night at six o'clock, I'm serving dinner. I'm putting vicious sword that Lizzie was so good at making on the table for his son, who is the vice president of the First National Bank, and his son-in-law, who was the president of the First National Bank. And as I'm serving the vicious war, he says, children, I have something to tell you. Yes, Pop, Vernon can read. Vernon can read. They knew that I could read. Mm -hmm. They knew that I was a student at DePaul University because they were younger, they dealt with my mother, and that's how I got the job. Right. So <clears throat> the next day, we pick up Jim Robinson's grandfather. Jim Robinson used to be the CEO at American Express, and I was a director. And we were going down Peachtree Street. And Mr. Maddox says to his friend, Vernon can read. So I finish DePaul Law School and I go back to Atlanta to work for Don Hollowell for $35 a week. We filed a lawsuit to get Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes admitted to the University of Georgia. And, and we won the case and in January, of 1961, six months after I'm out of law school, I'm escorting Charlene Hunter 
through the mobs at the University of Georgia. Mr. Maddox is sitting there, can barely see. And there I am on television going through the mobs and the crowds. And his nurse says, Mr. Maddox, you see that colored lawyer? You know who he is? He says, no, I don't, I can barely see him. Who, who, why are you telling me? She said, that's your chauffeur, Vernon. He said, I always knew that <laughs> was up to no good. <laughs> so that's where, that's how I got the title of my book. Vernon can read it from Mr. Maddox. Mr. Maddox. Yeah. Well, can you talk a little bit about some of the major struggles you experience really trying to push that kind of change through the legal system and maybe how that affected you personally and professionally? When I was Don Hollowell, who was the big civil rights lawyer after A.T. Walden, was paying me $35 a week. I had a wife and a daughter and I was as happy as I could be because I was doing what I went to Howard University Law School, the West Point of the Civil Rights Movement. That's what I went to do. And so it, I was not disturbed that I was not making a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. I was excited that we were driving every day to the University of Georgia at Athens <coughs> to dig out <coughs> information in preparation for, for, for the lawsuit. I was doing what I really wanted to do. My classmates say, you stay here in Washington, you can go to work for the government. I said, I came to law school to go back home to practice law, and that's what I did. And you were a leader in this tumultuous time in our country and had so many different roles in that era. Can you talk a little bit about some of those significant changes you saw and maybe talk about where we are today? Do you see sort of similarities and how do people have hope to keep pushing forward given sort of it feels almost like we've gone backwards in some ways? When you think about all the things that you fought so hard for. I. Uh Let me tell you why I left the practice of the law. During the University of Georgia case, we're in the judge's chambers in Macon, Georgia, and the Attorney General Eugene Cook, who was on the other side of us defending the university, said to me, said, you know, Vernon, we're going to have to teach you a lesson. And I said, what kind of lesson you want to teach me, Mr. Attorney General? He said, before you got out of law school, you were down here serving subpoenas on the university president, the state superintendent of education. So we're going to have to teach you a lesson. And I said, what's the lesson? He said, forget about passing the bar. That was the attorney general of Georgia. Eugene Cook was his name. He said, just don't worry about it. But I should tell you that your partner, Horace Ward, who had sued the university early to get into the law school and went to Chicago as a result, uh, said he made the highest score, one of the highest scores ever made on the Georgia bar exam. I said, Mr. Attorney General, how do you know that? It's all kept by numbers. He said, it is kept by numbers, but we keep up with y'all. <laughs> meaning they kept up with those of us who were black. So I'm taking the bar exam. The first course, the first subject was ethics. Got through that, boom. Mm -hmm. The next subject was real property. A gives to B, but if C goes to Rome, you know, lawyers know about that. And it was really hard. And right in the middle of it, I had to go to the bathroom. And you take the bar exam in the House of Representatives in the Georgia State Capitol. So I get up and I head to the bathroom. The proctor gets between me and the bathroom. And he says, the bathroom for colors is downstairs. 
and I said, Mr. Exam Proctor, the real estate section of this exam is very difficult, and I have to urinate very badly. And if you don't get out of my way, I'm going to urinate on you. <laughs> and he stepped aside, and I used the bathroom that white people had been using all the time. But I flunked the bar exam. <laughs> <laughs> I flunked the bar exam because it was not intended for you. that I should pass the bar. So I went to Arkansas mm -hmm. with the help of Wiley Branton of Pine Bluff, mm -hmm. my friend, my law partner, my predecessor as head of the Board of Education Project. And I went to Arkansas. I took the bar. They called and said, you pass. And I didn't believe it. I called them back and said, are you sure? And they said, we're sure. And they put it in the Little Rock paper that Arkansas some guy from said. Georgia called back to be sure that he Pass the ball. Uh, but the notion that because I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer and was working for a civil rights lawyer, that the attorney general of the state saw to it that I, so I never passed the Georgia bar, but I passed the Arkansas bar and then a liberal judge called me up one day and said, Vernon, I want you to come over here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and I'm going to swear you in to the Georgia Bar. And that's how I got admitted to my home state bar. So I belong to Georgia, Arkansas, and the District of Columbia. I love that. Everything always comes full circle to Arkansas, doesn't it? I love that. Yeah. Well, I think it's time to open this uh, for questions from the audience here. So why don't we get started and I'll try to... See, don't all your hands go up at once. But I, I'm going to you, tell you one more story you about. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about DePaul. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's one young lady. One day I'm walking up Local Street, going to class, and this young white girl, co-ed, passes me. And she says, hello, Vernon Jordan. And I said, hello, and kept going. That night when she said her prayer, she said, Lord, I spoke to the colored student today. <laughs> I mean, that was for her a, a huge thing. This is 19, 1957. But then I was taking these courses in speech and Peg Taylor was in my class, and she was very nice and very smart. And so one day she said, Vernon, can I see you after class? And I said, sure. And she said, Vernon, I want to ask you something. She said, will you be my escort at the house dance? my house dance. She was a tridel. Oh. said, will you be my escort? I said, are you sure you want to? She said, yeah. I want you to be my escort. I said, if you can handle it, I can handle it. So I'm in my room. It's 10 o'clock at night and Bud Gilbert, who lives across the hall, comes in, knocks on my door and comes in and says, you have stirred up the Tridell house. I said, what do you mean? He said, they put us out of the bum room where he was with his girlfriend. And the house mother called a meeting because her roommate, Peggy's roommate, told the house mother that Vernon Jordan, is that colored guy, is going to bring her to the house dance. And there was a vote in the house, and the house split. 50% said, said no and 50% said yes. 
the house mother took Peg into her room and called her parents and made her parents made her promise that she would not have me to escort her to the end. So she called me up about midnight and said, Vernon, I had to promise my parents. I said, Peggy, it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. She quit the sorority, became a big advocate for equal rights on the DePaul campus was elected president of the student body, was given the Walker Cup at commencement, and loaned to me her car. Because she was president of the student body, she was the only student that could have a car. But she loaned it to me every weekend so I could drive to Earlham and to Indiana University or to Indianapolis looking for a date. <laughs> that was kind of all right, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Peggy and I stayed in touch. And she became a professor out in California, and she died about three years ago. But we were great friends, and she was a great woman who defied mm -hmm. the whole system uh, at DePaul University. Um, I got the president to come to DePaul and give a lecture. I went out and introduced him. He gave a great speech. And we had a great time. Talk a little bit about that experience. What was that like for you in those eight years, knowing that you probably had more influence than anyone else? Do you have any stories you could share from that time period? You know, some really intense moments. And then also, can you talk about like one of the most fun moments that you all had during those eight years? Because there were so many of them. Well, Maybe you could share from your vantage point. The most memorable part for Anne, my wife, and my kids and grandkids was that for the eight years that the Clintons were in the White House, every Christmas Eve was spent at our house. They came to have Christmas Eve dinner with us. And the kids in the neighborhood after the first Christmas, figured it out. So they would be standing in front of our house <laughs> waiting for the president to show up on Christmas Eve. And the president was so gracious. He shook everyone's hand before he, that's why he was late most of the time. Oh, I know. I he know was somewhere <laughs> shaking hands and being friendly. And he shook hands with all those kids. So about oh, 10 years ago, this reporter comes to see me. And he says, Mr. Jordan, you won't remember me, but I was one of the children standing in line in front of your house to shake President Clinton's hand. He worked for Business Week. I, I don't even remember his name, but we, we have had some great times together. And it was, there's a great picture in our house on Christmas Eve of President Clinton with two of my grandsons in his lap as because Jordan, my oldest grandson, got a book and took the book and put it in the president's hand and said, read to me. <laughs> and then his cousin mm -hmm. saw 
Jordan in the lap and he went and got on the other side. Mm -hmm. And there's this wonderful photograph that's in our house of the President of the United States reading to my grandchildren. And that's, that, that I never forget, as I will never forget, a singing, lift every voice and sing. Is there a YouTube and video of that? I would really like to. No, there's Is no. Is it before YouTube? Before? <laughs> uh, we, we weren't in tune, but we were, <laughs> we knew the words. Knew he the word. knew every word. I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure. All right. Oh, Mara. We've come a long way, and we got a long way to go. Mm. Uh, 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 the current president of the United States is, it's such like having Lester Maddox as governor of Georgia. For me, it's like having Eugene Talmadge and Herman Talmadge and Marvin Griffin. I'm back to where I used to be, but we've been here before. Mm -hmm. And so we know what we need to do. And we've never, ever given up. When, <clears throat> when we came, we didn't come voluntarily to this country. We were bought and brought, but we persevered. The Constitution made us three-fifths of a person, but we persevered. The Dred Scott decision said a black man had no rights that a white man was bound to respect, but we persevered. The Civil War was supposed to set us free, but the Compromise of 1877 set us back, but we persevered, and it's we kept going, and we will, we will keep going. Um, I don't like it, what's going on right now, but I'm going to say at Michigan State next week that the next generation has to take the baton and, and keep going. And because we kept going, we got where we are. And if we keep going, we're going to get where we should be. And it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It is not easy. Uh, at Michigan State next week, I'm going to remind young people of the words of the song that I've known since I was having Negro History Week in elementary school. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring. That was James Weldon Johnson 120 years ago. Jacksonville, Florida. He wrote the words and his brother wrote the music. And in any moment of, of despair and discouragement, 
I go back to those three verses. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way. And therein lies, I think, the, the inspiration to keep at it. I mean, if we had turned back, we wouldn't be where we are now. And we are a long way from where we used to be, mm -hmm. but we still, we still got a long way to go. Wow. Well, this is a room full of idealistic young people that are working at the Clinton Foundation because they care deeply about our world and making it a more fair, just place for everyone. So I know your message, of in, your, you've been inspirational. You've shared some of your leadership stories, and I know that's really resonated with the folks here today. So thank you so much, Vernon, for taking the time to be with us. Well, well, you you have made my day, and the eight years that President Clinton was president, a lot of things happened. Mm -hmm. But what the best thing that happened is that whenever we got a chance, we went to the golf course, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and there were times when we played in the snow. We would hit the ball and we couldn't find it because the ball was white and the snow was white. But we, we kept playing and it was, it was release for him and release for me. And we had a great time, Mr. President. Absolutely. And since, that's right. Wow. So don't we have to go home? I think we're good, yes. We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank